evening and welcome to this week's edition of Chicago Newsroom 2.0. I'm your host, Andy Zapp. In tonight's roundtable, we'll take another look at the migrant crisis, which continues to present major challenges to the city. But first, I'll sit one-on-one -on -one with the city's inspector general discussing the recently released report that summarizes concluded investigations, inquiries, intakes, and other key operations of the Office of Inspector General. We'll get started on the other side of this short break. Stay with us. Hello, I'm Kimberly Loftus and I am financially secure. I have made it my business to help you achieve the same financial transformation for 2024. Let me help you have a positive money mindset to increase wealth and less anxiety about money. You don't have to save $1,000 a month. Mm -hmm. You can literally save $50 a month. That's how I started. In the Money airs on Thursdays at 7 p.m. on CanTV19, CanTV.org, and on the all new CanTV Plus app. Experience the power of community television. In its quarterly reports, as provided by law, the Office of Inspector General publishes summaries of sustained, completed investigations within the quarter. A few of the key findings reported in the most recent quarter included two Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection employees who incompetently performed their duties when, during the protests and unrest following the murder of George Floyd in May 2020, they improperly issued a cease and desist notice to a not-for-profit that was supporting community members in need and an elected city official who terminated the employment of two city employees shortly after the employees disclosed to the official that they believed he was violating the City of Chicago Governmental Ethics Ordinance, or GEO, and the U.S. and Illinois constitutions by improperly using city resources. To further discuss these findings and others, I'm joined by the Inspector General for the City of Chicago, Deborah Witzberg. Thanks, welcome back. Thank nice, you so much. Nice Thanks. to see you. Thanks for having me. So before we get into some of the details of your report, um, just tell, tell us a little bit about why you have to do, why you do these reports and what you're trying to accomplish by including this information and publicizing them. And it's obviously required by law, but I'm sure there's some other goals. It is. That's the first good reason to do <laughs> exactly, it. <laughs> exactly. You have to. Indeed. Uh, our quarterly reports are, in fact, the only place where the law authorizes us to make public statements about our administrative investigative work. Those are the, the investigations we undertake when a city actor has broken the rules. When we are doing those cases in an administrative context, we are not allowed to speak publicly about them. Instead, the law permits us to offer de-identified summaries of these investigations in the quarterly report. And so these reports are a really valuable vehicle because it's, it's the window um, that the public has into the work we are doing to hold bad actors accountable when they break the rules. We can't do accountability work in secret. And so it's really important that, that we tell these stories in this report. Right, and I think it's important to remind people that that's the whole point of what you do, which is to hold public officials and employees accountable because they're supported by our dollars and they should be following the rules that they that they uh, are set for their performance and behaviors. So, uh, you know, I talked about two matters. One was the city employee and um, who uh, basically stopped a not-for-profit or uh, issued a stop not-for-profit to uh, um, an organization that was trying to do good work. Can you talk a little bit about why that was a problem? That was a situation in which um, following, or in the midst really of the protests and unrest, as you mentioned, following mm -hmm. the murder of George Floyd, um, an enforcement team from the Department of Building Affairs and Consumer Protection visited a site where a nonprofit, as you said, was providing snacks and respite um, and issued a cease and desist order. We found that that was based on a misunderstanding, a failure to appropriately understand the applicable law and a failure to appropriately supervise those employees. That's an important story. Um, not in spite of the chaos that surrounded those events, but because of it. It's precisely when things go wrong that people need to be able to rely on city government um, to sort of to, to keep order and to behave appropriately um, and to keep people safe. So let's talk about the other one, the other one that I mentioned, which really is uh, you know employees doing what we want them to do, which is to go, hey, you know, this is this is a problem. How you're spending these dollars, um, and in exchange for that, they got fired, right? So, talk a little bit about that. What you can about that that case? Uh, we we take 
violations of the city's ethics ordinance very, very seriously. One of the things we've been working hardest at over the course of the last couple of years is more rigorous, more aggressive enforcement of the city's ethics rules. Those are the rules that stand between us and a government people have no reason to trust. Mm -hmm. um, this case is a situation where city employees, exactly as you say, um, raised concerns about compliance with the ethics ordinance and other applicable laws. Um, and we found that they were inappropriately terminated for having done so, that they were retaliated against. So we sustained those allegations. We sent that case to the city's board of ethics. And as the ethics ordinance provides, that case is now with the board. The subject of the investigation has an opportunity to meet with the board mm -hmm. to rebut the finding. Um, but again, like, like, like the underlying violations of the ethics ordinance, we must take retaliation accusations very, very seriously. Um, we should, all of us, all of us in city government should be doing everything we can to encourage people mm -hmm. to speak up when the rules are getting broken. We cannot, we cannot be in a situation where city officials who occupy positions of public trust are retaliating against people for speaking up when the rules get broken. Right. Um, any other kind of story, or not stories, but does summaries from your uh, report that come to mind for you that you want to make sure we talk to tell people about conduct that uh, you uncovered that you thought was problematic? Maybe a couple of specific things and a couple of, of general things. Um, we reported on a criminal case charged as a result of an OIG investigation this quarter. That was a clerk's office employee who was stealing money out of the cash register, basically. Yeah, that's a problem. In the course of city <laughs> sticker sales. Um, so that's an investigation that we worked on. Um, we brought it to our prosecuting partners. It was criminally charged. Wow. Um, that's an important accountability measure. That's, that's someone who, again, was in a position of public trust, handling taxpayer dollars. Um, and committed a crime doing so. So that's that's an important outcome. We also reported in this quarter the successful prosecution of an individual for obstructing an OIG investigation. That's the oh, first wow. such prosecution of which we are aware. Uh, we are serious about doing our work right. to, keep, to hold bad actors accountable, um, and we have every intention to prosecute those who obstruct our efforts to do so. Wow. So um, we, we also talked about the fact, and although it's still happening, is PPP prosecutions of, of people who are working for the city government. And, um, and, then, and there's not a problem necessarily with having an outside business, but people who are engaging in fraud for PPP loans, which people remember, that strikes me as a problem, right? If you're yeah. working for the city and but you're lying to the federal government to take money that was supposed to be helping uh, businesses. Uh, so are you, you're still doing some of those, I hear. We certainly are. We certainly are. And that is exactly the foundational problem in those cases. You cannot both work for the government and defraud the government. That right. is fundamentally inconsistent with, with your duties as a public servant. So we have done, we're doing both reactive investigative work on those cases where we're responding to tips and complaints that we get, and we have done proactive data analysis to generate investigative leads. This is too big a body of facts for us to, um, to, to track down each one kind of with traditional methods. So we've used proactive data analysis tools. We've identified about a thousand loans issued to people under our jurisdiction. Many, although certainly not all of those loans have some indicia of fraud. Mm -hmm. And so we are investigating those cases. We, are, we will pursue some of them administratively, some of them criminally, and we are making prioritization decisions um, about which, which to pursue and how. Um, we are quickly running out of time, so, but I also just want, just want people to know kind of the scope. How many cases did you all process uh, in the last quarter? We got about 2,000 intakes wow. in the quarter. We heard from about 8,000, heard from Chicagoans about 8,000 times in 2023. That's a very big and growing number. That's very good news from my perspective. Chicagoans know Chicago best, and we're very anxious to hear from them. Right, well, um, I uh, am uh, really, uh, I'm, I'm sad that we ran out of time, but I'm glad, I know, I'm happy to know that you will come back. Anytime. And what I want the, you know, my audience to know is that this work is ongoing and how important it is so that they know that the, their hard dollars that they then pay to the city and the state, um, that, that there's somebody looking at to ensure that people are doing the jobs that we pay them to do, that they're handling the money that we give them to handle in ways that they should be. So for all of the thousands of city and government employees who do their job well every day, that their work isn't undercut by those who choose not to. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Deborah, for thank coming you. back and thank you for the work you do. Uh, and we will be right back. Thank you. This week on Change Agents, we will meet some leaders 
We're using art to not only uplift injustices faced by marginalized communities, but to also empower our black and brown youth. Show up as yourself and we'll open up those doors, but just make sure you radically are yourself at all times. Join me Thursday at 7.30 p.m. on CanTV19. Stream us live on CanTV.org or watch us on the CanTV Plus app. Experience the power of community television. As temperatures plunge into negative territory, the flow of migrant asylum seekers descending upon the Windy City by the bus and plane load continues. Seeking asylum for horrific conditions in home countries like Venezuela, Mexico, Colombia, and Ecuador, the migrants are being used as pawns in a shameful game of political posturing being perpetrated by the Republican governor of Texas, who has refused Governor Pritzker's request to suspend the buses during Chicago's harsh winter. For its part, Chicago continues the difficult work of providing basic necessities for the asylum seekers, a challenge exacerbated by the cost and complexity of developing a comprehensive plan and a reported schism between the mayor and governor on how best to house, educate, and otherwise address the newest arrivals' needs. To help me take a closer look at this significant and quickly evolving crisis, I'm joined by two journalists who are no strangers to our viewers, Austin Weekly News reporter Francia Garcia Hernandez and the host of Can TV original program, Three Questions with Hugo Balta. Welcome back, Francie and Hugo. Thank you so much. Um, so let's just get started. So we, we talked about this last, last uh, this topic not too long ago, um, but much has happened since then. How are we assessing, how are we grading the city on their performance now? Hugo, I'll start with you. I think they're still getting a failing grade. You know, we, we've been talking about the influx of migrants primarily coming from Venezuela since 2022. And certainly you know, we're talking about the Lightfoot administration, that the uh, Brandon Johnson inherited, mm -hmm. um, but it's almost a year now since he was elected, and it, my, the the my, migrant crisis will certainly dominate the report card of his first year in office. Francie. I, I agree, yes, definitely. I think um, I covered several forums during the um, mayoral election, mm -hmm. and this was not a topic that many candidates were thinking about, despite this happening during the Lightfoot administration. So I think the city has failed to prepare, and it's, it's a challenge. It's ever evolving, it's ever changing, it's very, very difficult, but there still needs to be a plan for this, because we knew this was happening, um, and w it will continue to happen. Mm -hmm. So what do you think still are the biggest areas that the, you mentioned a plan, well, and I'll circle back to that. What are the other biggest areas you think the city needs to do a better job of focus and state need to do a bigger, better job of focusing on? And county, by the way. <laughs> it, it, it's a multi-pronged pro uh, problem that requires a multi-pronged solution. I think the first thing is the narrative needs to change from one that's heavy on the negative in regards to uh, just the number of migrants coming uh, to the city and then just uh, the, how it's exacerbating the current resources. In reality, the, it's an opportunity to be realized. Without uh, the immigrant population, Chicago and the state, of Chica uh, the state of Illinois would have seen a decrease in population growth in the last census. Um, this is the, the, the current and future workforce of the state um, that is uh, uh, historically necessary in order for the, the local, state, and, and uh, uh, federal uh, economic uh, engine to move um, uh, forward. So I think the narrative needs to change quickly from a negative to a positive. But unfortunately, what we've seen historically is these are uh, people without a voice and, and that they are um, exploited, uh, both politically exploited, as you mentioned, uh, and there will certainly be a punching bag as we enter it knee deep into the presidential election. So, and you talked about, uh, Francia, a, a comprehensive plan. Talk, tell me a little bit more about what you think, what you would like to see, or you think you know, we should be seeing that we're not. Well, I think, you know, the needs of migrants are so complex. It's, uh, it's so big, right? We have individuals, we have families, we have children who have come here alone. So there is a, a, bit, a big spectrum of needs. But from what I noticed in, you know, reporting covering the West Side when migrants were at police stations, mm -hmm. There was something positive about the volunteer-led response that um, I think the city should take note of. And they were 
they were there, right? They were on the field, they were talking to migrants and families and kids. So they understood the needs from basic needs like food and shelter and clothes and shoes and bags to medical care, to education, to these kids need to go to school. How can we help them enroll? How can we help them navigate paperwork and IDs and things that they don't need to even SIM cards and cell phones? Mm -hmm. I saw many volunteers on the west side um, and west suburbs collecting um, cell phones mm -hmm. and SIM cards to help them keep track of their asylum cases so mm -hmm. that they could attend their immigration court um, appointments and things like that. So these are volunteers who noticed every s single thing that um, migrants needed and work together as individuals, as Chicagoans to provide. And I think the city needs to start looking at all of these needs comprehensively and start, you know, um, devoting resources and city departments to facilitate this. Yeah, well, I think that point about uh, volunteers is really critical. Um, you know, we, you know, we, 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 the, anyone who lives near a police station uh, saw it when, when uh, the, the asylum seekers were at the police stations, and I think that's been a critical part. You know, um, I know that there are a couple of larger um, not-for-profits, Catholic Charities, and New Life uh, in particular that have been involved. Uh, to me, it says a positive thing about the city, right? So it's, it's a volunteer thing from individuals to bigger organizations. I don't know, what do you think, Hugo? I think the, that um, absolutely, the key to success is to partner with organizations that um, have been embedded in the, in the communities and can really assist in meeting the immediate needs of the newcomers. But the biggest, the bigger problem is the the long term. the The courts are are overwhelmed. We need more judges because part of the problem is the process. To uh, once they get here, to to provide to for them to to become permanent residents. But the, these these here these uh, hearings take a, a very long time because the the court system is overwhelmed. So you need more judges um, in order for them to go through the process. The the problem. The, that we need is for the, both the state and the federal government to stop the, using uh, the, these people um, as a, a political ploy uh, for their agenda and really get to uh, solving the problems because the, there's, this country needs the immigrants in, in regards for uh, blue collar and pink collar uh, industries but they're not doing what, what's necessary in order for them to become permanent residents of the United States. Right, and I think that, that's a really important, a uh, really crit critical point, um, <clears throat> particularly because it, you know, as we still have asylum seekers coming and they're allowed into the country uh, for a limited period of time, the process then for them to get work permits and others, and in fact, many of them are not even eligible for work permits. And so they then become part of the undocumented population that has right now has no pathway. This is a federal issue. So, um, and, you know, what are you, what are your think, thoughts on the federal response and, and uh, to this challenge, um, both about dealing with how do we improve the process for getting people the ability to work? Because what we've seen is so many want to work, uh, they want to be able to support their families, um, but also being able to work, but also to have a better process for the possibility of becoming documented. Yes, absolutely. And um, I think the federal government and Congress have a responsibility there. Um, there is, if you look at the immigration system, there is UACIS, which processes cases, but there's also the court, you know, immigration court system. And both um, systems are restrained. Um, the court system has like a 1.8 million backlog from every hmm. year. And that was exacerbated during COVID and they have, you know, infrastructure challenges and they have technology challenges and they have budget challenges. And then USCIS is mostly funded by fees that, you know, right. immigrants pay to come here both for tourism purposes, for residency purposes, for any purpose, right? So there are many challenges. Some of their systems are outdated. A lot of forms have to be mailed and have to be paper forms. So there are many opportunities to um, improve these systems that would make that backlog Redu be reduced and then you know make the process faster. I also think changes in immigration law and the rhetoric and the narrative make it harder sometimes for judges to have decisive um, you know rules to decide on cases. So sometimes you see cases 
drag on because they, you know, they have a decision and then immigration law changes and then there's opportunities to appeal. So even a single case can take so long and that adds to the backlog as well. So as we look at this, um, a lot of it is, you know, is the narrative is about funding and how is the federal government funding um, states mm -hmm. that are receiving asylum seekers. But we should also be asking the questions that like, how are they going to improve the efficiency of these governmental agencies that are in charge of expediting these processes? Right. And enforcing the laws because the, the government spends too much time on, on curtailing the people that are, are crossing, that are, that are coming to the United States and not punishing the, the, the companies and the people that are, and the reasons why they're coming. The only reason why they're coming is because there are jobs here. Mm -hmm. but, you, but you don't see enough of the enforcing of, of laws uh, of those companies that are hiring them. And in many times, uh, again, exploiting them, uh, not, getting, not giving them a, a livable wage, uh, and even the influx of, of the newcomers that we're seeing, um, compete, get them to compete against each other until the government has an emphasis on punishing those that are creating the situation, why they're coming uh, to this country in the first place, there's not gonna be a change. But it's, it's, not con it's not convenient for whether you're a Republican or Democrat. President Biden had an opportunity, had the Senate, had, um, uh, had a House of Representatives, and, and uh, of course he's a Democrat, and in his first year, he had the uh, political um, clout and support to in enact changes uh, with immigration reform, and that didn't happen. And for the Republicans, it's too late. It's part of their narrative to to use the immigrants as a political ploy to talk to their base. They've gone too far off to really come to to the table to reach any agreement on immigration reform because it, it'll go against what they're they, they are promising, uh, whether it's for president or at the local level. Right, you know, the real challenge is we have to have the will, right? I think tough issues require will to get resolution, and we haven't really had the will uh, to address it, uh, which I think adds to all of this. I don't know, you know, I don't, do we, does that, does it, is, do, is it hopeless? Do, uh, Francine, do you think we can ever get there? Um, I think looking at the history of, you know, the country and the city, and looking at this from an international perspective, Immigration is not new and it's not going to stop. We've seen um, different types of rhetorics and pushes for and against migration everywhere and in the United States. Um, but I think there are many opportunities for hope in the city as well. And I saw this through my reporting, you know, uh, working with um, migrants who were here and who came maybe two or three years ago legally established and, you know, are now helping new arrivals. We, you see it with new arrivals who are eager to work and have decided, you know, they're going to make it work for them and their families because this might be their only chance for survival, for their kids to get education, for their families back in their home countries to get food or medical care. So they have very strong reasons to push and keep going. And I think um, that's a reminder for all Chicagoans that, you know, there is hope, they have hope, they want to work, they want to be established here, they want a good life for their families, they don't want to cause any problems. That's what I heard multiple times. And I think when we focus on that and when we see them that, you know, many of them that were at the police station two months later, they were like, oh, I have a new apartment, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. So there is hope, there is a way out. And um, I think that's where we should also be focused on. Right, Hugo, I think we talked about this earlier. You know, this is, and uh, Francine just touched on it. This is not just a, you know, they're coming to the border and then they're coming to Chicago issue. This is a global world. It's a national issue, immigration and, and, and immigration reform. And it, but it's a world issue, right? You right, a you, you mentioned that uh, 8 million right. Venezuelans have, have left our country and obviously they're not all coming to the United States. A lot of the neighboring countries, Colombia, Peru, um, they've seen also an influx. A lot of the, the, the Venezuelans that are coming to the United States have first gone to their neighboring countries and then from there come to the United States. And we talked about the same, a similar situation happening in Europe where, where a lot of immigrants from the, the African continent, from the Middle East, they're they're also going to, to Europe, and particularly, I think Germany has the largest number of, of immer, uh, influx of immigrants. But I, I do think this country has a history of exploiting 
uh, people, beginning with slavery uh, up until you know today. So I, I do feel like yes. We do have wins that we can point to, especially at the local level, and I don't want to dismiss that. But I, I don't think um, it is in this country's best interest to solve uh, immigration because it, it, will, uh, it hits them where it hurts economically. Yeah. Well, uh, I refuse to end on that, that very serious note. So I do want to just circle back to um, some of the positive stories. Uh, you know, Francia just told us about some she's heard. I know you have heard at least one. So tell me one, you know, kind of hope story of, of uh, somebody coming in and getting settled well that you've heard in your reporting. Well, certainly. I, I think another coalition to mention is Welcome Chicago, yeah. uh, led by the Latino Policy Forum. Um, the com you know. The, our community comes together um, and shows up very big uh, when it matters most. And I think uh, um, it, it's an example for the rest of the country. Um, we roll up our sleeves, um, we help others, and in doing so, we, we know that we're helping ourselves. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I think I, I have hope in that we can leverage those wins, um, but uh, politically, especially in an election year, we need to turn those wins into action um, and Agreed. and and put a face to to this issue because a lot of a lot of the rhetoric that happens especially in mainstream media is statistics right. they're just numbers but we need to put faces to those people including you know this, the young person that unfortunately you know died a, a right. couple of weeks ago in, in one of those temporary housing um, uh, establishments uh, we can't forget that no. uh, that can't happen again these are human beings we're talking about they're not it's not a thing it's they're humans yes. and and which is why the stories of hope matter because they're 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 coming here for better lives and and uh, every day somebody steps up to try and make that happen is very powerful but it's a really important topic and we have a lot of work to do yes. no question about it we are shockingly out of time <laughs> thank you so much for to both of you for being here again uh, as always it's a powerful and uh, important conversation and I really appreciate you both Thank you. We will be right back with my final thoughts. Hi, I'm Bianca Cotton. On a new episode of Behind the Confidence Smile, I'll be sitting in conversation with Janice Nelson. Before then, it was just even the fear of finishing because I had been to school multiple times and didn't finish. Now I finish. Join the conversation on Can TV Cable Channel 19 and streaming on CanTV.org and CanTV Plus app. Experience the power of community television. As I closed the September 20th, 2023 episode of this program, I stated that life would be forever changed for the migrants stepping off the buses arriving in Chicago. I also stated how life for Chicagoans would also be changed as we grappled with the dual reality that is the genuine desire to support our newly arrived brothers and sisters and a deeply rooted frustration that limited resources needed by residents in the city's most underserved communities are now also needed to support the new arrivals. In the nearly five months since I uttered those words, thousands more asylum seekers have come to the city looking for safety and opportunity. Nearly two years since the first buses arrived in Chicago, the city, county, and state continued to work to build an effective, coordinated effort to address the humanitarian crisis and to drive increased federal engagement and support. Volunteers, both individuals and organizations, have been stepping up to help in countless ways. It's time for federal leadership to do the same to put aside bickering and partisanship, and to support local leadership in bringing together the resources like funding for housing and services and pathways to jobs and work, which are necessary for a truly humane plan that directly addresses this very human crisis. Thank you, Chicago, for joining the conversation tonight. Until next time, be well and well-informed. Good night.